You are now listening to Sorel Gorgor MD. Hey guys, Sorel Gorgor MD, and let's go ahead and start talking about cervical spine MRI technique. So here I have three sagittal sets of images. So we're going to talk about what these are. I'm also going to show this uh, axial set of images here. I'm going to get into that, but uh, I'll start off here with the uh, three sagittal sets of images. So starting from left to right, I have a T1 weighted here, I have T2 weighted here, non-fat suppressed, and I have here on the, on the, all the way on the right, the stir imaging, which is T2 weighted with fat suppression. So T1 weighted, T2 weighted, T2 weighted with fat suppression. So kind of one of the first few questions I had about cervical MRI was, why do I have three things? You know, I'd rather just have one thing. Why do I have three things? Well, the reason we have three things is because each set of images tells us something different about the tissues in the cervical spine. And we can actually use that to our advantage. So rather than spending more time with three sets of images, we actually spend less time because we get what we want out of each set of images. And so the set of images I like the most is really this one right here in the middle. It's T2 weighted, right? It has fluid around the spinal cord, which is high in signal. It's also sort of T1 weighted. It has high signal in the marrow elements. It has high signal in the fat here, the fat here between the spinous processes and the subcutaneous fat. It sort of has the most intrinsic contrast, and therefore it's the easiest for my eyes to understand. It allows me to very quickly figure out where this study is going. What is the point of this study? And again, for the stuff that I read, typically what it's going to tell me is that there is disc disease at C5-6, and that's where I need to focus my energy. But we have the T2-weighted images here. Again, good intrinsic contrast, good signal-to-noise ratio, um, but um, I'm mixing the T2-weighted signal abnormalities with kind of some T1 uh, weighted high signal. Um, so that means I need to go over here to the stir. So this, what the stir does is it sats out all the high signal from the fat and leaves me with just the whatever is high signal is coming from fluid. So I can see again it's T2 weighted. I can see high signal surrounding the cord. Um, but now all those fatty elements have been satted out. So the subcutaneous fat is dark. The fat in the uh, marrow space has been darkened. Any sort of subtle fluid-based process is going to really become conspicuous to my eye. So, for example, if there is a very subtle uh, fracture of an upper thoracic vertebra, a, a subtle compression fracture, my eye would go straight there because this set of images would show me that subtle fluid inside the vertebral body. If there was a small ligament tear, you know, if the posterior longitudinal ligament was torn from an acute uh, cervical injury, like in a car accident, I could see that little break in the uh, ligament and I could see that fluid and this would really make that finding conspicuous, where otherwise it might be difficult to find on the T2-weighted images that are not fat suppressed. What do I lose with the stir imaging? Well, what I lose is that there is some, if you look here closely, you can see that the images are a little bit blurry. Um, there is less signal-to-noise ratio in a stir image than there is on the uh, T2-weighted non-fat suppressed images. And that is kind of uh, the trade-off. It ends up being that you get good evaluation of the fluid abnormalities, but you lose a little bit of that intrinsic uh, tissue contrast. What the T1-weighted set of images tell me is that any sort of fat-based abnormality, so the marrow space here, the uh, vertebral marrow, has high signal relative to the disc because there is fat inside the vertebral body. Um, there's a marrow space there. It's a cancellous bone. It's full of fat and um, also hematopoietic elements. And kind of the overall balance of that is such that you're going to get a high signal in the vertebral marrow. If that signal is lost from whatever process, any sort of infiltrative process like tumor ingrowth or maybe infection, I'm going to get a loss of that high T1-weighted signal. And that's something I'm going to pick up really on this set of images only. If there was a diffuse uh, hematologic process uh, where there is a proliferation of hemat hematopoietic elements inside the vertebral marrow, and the fat signal is lost, I'm going to see that here on this set of images. I really not, may not notice that so much on the T2-weighted set of images, and I may not notice it on the uh, stir images, but that's what the T1-weighted images uh, show me, show me those abnormalities that involve the vertebral marrow. Lastly, let's talk about the axial imaging. So you want to set up the axial images with references, because basically what you're doing is you're taking a cross-section of the spine and you're kind of filleting it out so you can see the, um, the different tissues with respect to the spinal cord. So basically you want to come down to a discal level. So here I'm at uh, 2, 3, 4, I'm at C4, 5. 
and I'm right at the disc level. And here we can see very clearly the uh, vertebral body, the disc. We can see its relationship to the spinal cord. We can see here the posterior elements. And we can see here these neural canals. And so what I can see very easily on the axial set of images is um, the disc disease relationship to the cord and any sort of degenerative change of the facet joint or the uncinate joint that would cause a neural canal narrowing. Now you may wonder why is on this um, axial images, why is the bone so dark? Um, that's because this is actually what's called a, a T2 star awaiting. This is a gradient image, so there is some uh, susceptibility artifact. And since bone is not quite metallic, but it's definitely very, um, has a lot of calcium, so there's going to be that uh, dephasing, that loss of signal. It ends up being kind of a good thing on this axial imaging because you can sort of make out these uh, boundaries very nicely. I can see the boundaries of the bone. I can see the boundaries of the soft tissue. I can see the, uh, I still have T2 weighting, so I can still see fluid surrounding the cord. Um, but one of the uh, downsides is that sometimes if there's a prominent osteophyte, um, if it's very calcified, the, the dephasing could um, exaggerate how large that osteophyte is. It's just something to keep in mind. Uh, overall, though, I do find it to be a really, uh, really nice uh, image to look at each disc level in, uh, in more detail and basically get that information about the disc relative to the cord. So that's pretty much it. Those are the sequences of a cervical spine MRI, T1 weighted, T2 weighted, STIR, and then usually a gradient uh, T2 weighted axial. And those are, uh, those are the sequence of cervical spine MRI. We're going to move on to the next portion of this uh, video series, which is going to be anatomy.